Gender dysphoria is a mental health concern um, where a person has distress about an incongruence or a gap between their biological sex and their experience of gender. Okay, so there's a conflict there that is painful. There is a very clear shift socioculturally today against that. And that really comes from gender theorists. Uh, it, it's out of postmodern thought, feminist thought to say that, you know, our bodies ought not be prescriptive of our gender identity. They ought not be prescriptive of our fertility. Can we change the body almost as, as we will to make it more comfortable to us, to make it in alignment with our gender identity? You know, none of this would be as complicated as it um, as it is, but God certainly is not surprised by where we are. Mm. And I do believe he's ready to help each of us actually uh, discern uh, the truth and, and, and the lies that we can believe about ourselves. Don't move, you are surrounded, show me your hands. Yeppa, yeppa! I'm Beto Gudiño. I was smuggled into the United States as a missionary for Jesus to save American souls. All right, my friends, this show is brought to you by Christian Podcast. Our purpose is to create inspiring media for the 21st century faith aficionado. Check us out at christianpodcast.com. All right, so here we go. Okay, Julia, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm excited about today's topic because in the past, this has been the hottest topic on the show. Like people listen to the shows about this topic over and over and over. And it's the one with the most listens, most views, most everything. I think this is where it's at. You know, so I want to talk about a little bit of gender identities, maybe even transgender identities, which is the hottest topic, and especially focused on can people experiencing this find faith? And what does that look like? What is the intersection of faith and gender identity? Is there a middle ground? So we're going to discover that. But Julia, thank you so much for being here on the show. Would you just say you know a little bit of who you are and a little bit of what you do? Sure. So it's good to be with you. Um, and yeah, I guess I can share a little bit about my background, what I do, but I, uh, I'm a licensed psychologist here in Colorado and I work with a lot of people who are asking questions about gender identity. Um, specifically, I work with people of faith more often than not. So you ask, can people exploring these questions find faith? And some of them have faith. And I, I tend to see those individuals or their families where they were raised in a Christian faith community. And they're trying to figure out how do all of these different facets of life intersect? Can they? And what does that look like? Mm, wow. Okay, so... Welcome, and this is what I want to show you right now. It's a white piece of paper, and to the best of my abilities, I'm trying to come to this episode with a blank, blank sheet of paper. Like, I don't want to have ideas in my head. I mean, I do have, right? I mean, I have baggage. I have, uh, I have had shows with Preston Sprinkle. I have shows where we talk about sexuality, and... That's the baggage. But today I want to say, is there a way to have just like a blank paper and talk about these ideas in a new light? And I would say I would start right there. Is, is that how we are as humans? Do we start like this when we are born? Is, is this our life? Or would you say no? Like, in other words, um, do souls have genders? Or what is that like before we're even born? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. I think as a as a person of faith, right? I um, 
I certainly have my own understanding and I don't, I don't think I think of humans as blank slates uh, in and of ourselves. Even the idea that I or you or anybody could come to a conversation like this and just get rid of any of our understandings, you know, convictions, biases, those different things, you know, we all have that. And primarily we have our worldview, right? Which um, I think a, a Christian worldview to, to my knowledge, I'm not a philosopher by trade, but um, would be that, you know, there's kind of divine intention behind our creation and that we're not merely a piece of paper to be written on, um, that we have some level of, of purpose and meaning in, inscribed in our very beings uh, that God has intention around. And so how that factors into gender for all of us, I think, looks different person to person as far as how we can integrate God's plan for our lives and our uh, gender identities is going to manifest differently for different people um, based on a lot of different factors. And so um, I'm excited to talk about some of the nuances of that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so some of the different factors that um, nuance our identity. So mm -hmm. I'm already writing in this blank paper, you know, so I'm putting things like Christian worldview, divine intention, purpose, meaning, and the different factors. Um, so with that, I mean, you have a book that's right behind me. It's called Gender, Identity, and Faith. And as I was, you know, reading it, I think two, three things that struck me the most, it's you talk about three lenses, um, and I would love for you to elaborate real quick on what those mean, because I think that can kick off our conversation into, you know, just have a uh, common language. So you talk about integrity uh, or sacred, disability, departure, and diversity. Can you, can you just tell us what those even mean? Absolutely. So that comes out of much of my co-author's work. Mark Yarhouse has written a good bit on those lenses, and I use them a lot. I think they're really helpful as a starting point, so I'm glad we can start there. So the integrity lens is um, one way that I think people will approach the conversation of gender identity. And so there, it's called the integrity lens, not because Mark or I think it has the most integrity, but because people in that lens will use that language, so sacred integrity, to talk about kind of the meaning that they're making out of gender atypical experiences. So integrity lens people would say that God, you know, in Genesis 1 and 2 had a plan for human sexuality and human gender identity, and that would include ideas like um, there is complementary relationships between men and women. Um, God had creational intent out of making us embodied as male and female. And when people have things like gender dysphoria or uh, are asking questions about gender, confused about their gender identity, people from that lens would say that that's a sign of willful disobedience. Uh, so that those individuals are rejecting God's plan for them and they ought to repent of that sin um, in order to find healing and redemption. So that's integrity lens, kind of strong emphasis on Genesis 1 and 2. And the disability lens, people would say, maybe, you know, let's look at Genesis 3, the fall of humanity. And we know we live in a fallen world, so our gender identity, our experience of self as male, female, masculine, feminine is impacted by the fall. And in rare cases, perhaps, uh, there are people for whom that manifests in gender dysphoria. So the difference between integrity lens people and disability lens people, I, I think primarily is that people in the disability lens would say that no one chose to have gender dysphoria. People don't choose to wrestle in these ways. So they're not morally culpable for the wrestling that they experience. And as a result, we ought to treat them with compassion, accompany them on this journey. And then the diversity lens, which is kind of prominent, as, as you might know, in our communities, in our culture today, is a lens that would say, you know, gender identity is just like any other diversity variable. So race, ethnicity. Um, and because of that, we ought to celebrate the range of gender identities um, and not pathologize those. So they wouldn't like the disability lens people who say this is kind of a condition, a disability that you're wrestling with. They would say, no, like God intended for people to have different gender identities beyond male and female. And that tells you who you are, where you belong. 
and the ways in which to live out that gender identity in the world. So those are the three lenses. And you can see there's probably others, but those are primary ones that lead us all to get into quite a bit of conflict when we step into these conversations, because we all come at this from different lenses. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. It, a lot of conflict in my head. Uh, I think the only unifying element that I may be hearing right now is that you kind of mentioned God in all the three lenses. So mm -hmm. maybe all of those are still within the Christian worldview, right, of, of gender, in a sense. So maybe what you're saying is the Christian worldview right now has almost like three dimensions of, of looking at it, right? Three ways of looking at it. So let me see if I get it right. Um, integrity, I would call it more like the, the morality element. God has a plan. Sexuality was planned by God and anything outside of that plan needs to be repented of and it's considered sin. Uh, disability, it's, it's basically a little bit of the same concept, but you're not morally culpable. It's almost like you were born into this identity, right? You were born into uh, maybe a homosexuality or a different identity. I don't know, right? Um, and then diversity, uh, that one strikes me as like a newer thing for some reason. I don't know, uh, but maybe it is, right? But basically, what you're saying is um, on diversity, saying, hey, God made us like that all together, and therefore any gender identity needs to be celebrated, right? So is, is that kind of like what you're saying with the three lenses? That's right, yeah. And I think, you know, each of those lenses then inform how we respond to real people in this space. And um, certainly non-Christians use each of those lenses as well, I think, integrity lens people who are non not christian would focus more on biological elements like we have this biological blueprint and anything else is is not expected or good a disability lens could be outside of a christian context they just wouldn't talk about the fall as a reference point for disabilities and then diversity lens also obviously could be outside of a christian context but mm. um, what mark and i try to do in our writing as you might have read is we try to take what's best and and helpful in each of the three lenses and integrate them so after i can locate myself in the lens that is most helpful for me in approaching this conversation, can I at least see the value in different lenses? Because in any family, in any community, in different churches, you will find people who represent each of the three lenses. And it helps not solely with perspective taking, but also with perhaps honoring the value of, of different perspectives in helping us adequately respond to people today in this space. Okay, so the question here is, how do we respond? So I love that because... Uh, basically, I think what, what you're saying and, you know, based on, on, on the book and really almost like the title of the book is Faith and Gender Identities, right? So I'm mm -hmm. assuming out of these three lenses, you need to identify first, okay, which, which lens should I um, kind of like respond to this person to by maybe, maybe asking a few questions to kind of like, in a sense, you know, categorize people on their, okay, I think he comes from this background, right? This lens background. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you can help them. So... From your vantage point, do you think, where do you wrestle more with people trying to find faith out of these three mm -hmm. lenses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so I think, you know, when, when a young person, let's say, who has gender dysphoria comes to see me, and gender dysphoria is a mental health concern um, where a person has distress about an incongruence or a gap between their biological sex and their experience of gender. Okay, so there's a conflict there that is painful. So when I think about a person who experiences that, who's trying to make meaning out of it through an integrity lens, one of the biggest challenges that they bump up against in that lens is the shame that they feel for their very existence. Like, okay, so God doesn't make mistakes, but what does that mean about me? Am I a mistake? <laughs> Or did God intentionally create me knowing I would suffer in this way and, and kind of reject me in that? Like, go repent of that and then come back to me. So a distancing experience of God. Like, does God account for my experience? And, um, That can be really difficult to make sense of if, if you're kind of an integrity lens purist who is wrestling in this space. Um, 
for the disability lens, I think the value of that, again, is that it does reduce any kind of moral culpability for the experience of gender dysphoria, which I think for some people has been helpful. But what people can bump up up against there is feeling like, wait, am I merely defined by this almost disability I have? So am I solely a person with gender dysphoria? Does God have a plan for my life or is it just you're going to suffer and this is your lot to carry almost like cancer or something else? Like, is this just my lot in life? And then it doesn't really answer the coping mechanisms for how you deal with gender dysphoria. So a person in the disability lens will still wonder, am I allowed to, as a female, cut my hair short if that helps me with my gender dysphoria? Or is that not okay? Um, Am I allowed to consider things like hormones or surgeries? Or is that morally impermissible? Are those treatments moral, even if the experience is not a moral reality? And then the diversity lens, you know, I I would say that that lens initially did not come out of a Christian context. It came out of feminist theory and then gender theory that's emerged in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And so as we've seen that materialize, there have been Christians who have started to take that content in and try to understand it through a Christian lens. Um, But I think one of the biggest challenges with a strict diversity lens for people is that it it removes moral constraints, absolutely. And some people I meet with do believe that there are moral aspects of this discussion. There's things that you can do that are blessed by God and perhaps things that would not be blessed by God. And so it doesn't always give a vision for where the line is for people in that lens. And then I think the other piece is the diversity lens doesn't always appreciate the genuine suffering of some people with gender dysphoria because some of the messaging is that it's only painful because our society hasn't accepted everybody yet. Mm. And for some of the kiddos, especially I see with gender dysphoria, even in an accepting home, um, they find themselves wrestling at times with this reality of I was born in this body and no matter what I do, I will, I will have this body (laughs) my entire life. And that distress doesn't really get accounted for sometimes in the diversity lens. Mm. Wow. So we're in America and Mm -hmm. I'm here to no, you and me, we're here to save American souls. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And here's the interesting thing about America. I I haven't traveled the world much, but Mm -hmm. it seems to me like a lot of things happen in America. Right. So when you think of the United (laughs) Nations is in America, Mm -hmm. it's in the United States. So when you think of uh, psychology, marketing, like all these newer ideas that that happen in in academics all throughout, right? Um, A lot of it comes from America and maybe a westernized society, right? Mm -hmm. And it's exported to the world. So do you see a chronology element when it comes to these three lenses? Do you see a progression from the integrity lens to, okay, now we moved on as a society, maybe, maybe even as an American society, now we moved on to the disability lens and we're finally, I, I mean, that's maybe what I'm sensing, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. And, and now we're finally at the diversity lens, right? Like these two lenses kind of like pushed us to have the diversity mm-hmm. lens now. We wouldn't have it otherwise if we had in the other two lenses. And that's where we're at in society. Do you see any chronology uh, related elements? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know that I've thought of it in that way before, but um, it's helpful to hear you articulate that. I You know, I I think there is a developmental process to ideas, and I I think you could map that on in the scientific community, for instance, seeing um, initially gender atypicality, gender dysphoria, at least in Western countries and in psychology as a, you know, problem to be solved, something to be gotten rid of, um, and, and then more of a disability. So how do we treat this mental health concern Um, And then ultimately, certainly in the psychological community, you see a development and move away from that more disability framework um, and even the desire to remove gender dysphoria from our diagnostic manuals in order to say this is just a simple expression of human diversity. Mm. So so I think in the secular community, I I think um, you could see that and and perhaps in the church as well, insofar as it mirrors that development. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that I would see it linearly in that way as purely progress in every regard to move on that continuum. I think there's some things that can get lost in a, in a strict diversity lens that 
can't be accounted for there. And so um, probably some of the listeners who would see it more as like, we finally arrived to where we need to be as a society. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's value of the diversity lens for sure. I don't know that it fully accounts for every experience. And so that's where maybe I would be careful to just paint it as progress purely all the way through. Mm. Um, wow. Oof. So interesting. I, I, I have an idea that I'll maybe throw out there. But I'll save it for a little Great. later. I'll save it for a little later. Because right now, what's stirring in me is... Uh, so, basically, okay, we have... Uh, well, let me think about the question first. Mm -hmm. Gender. We are humans in this planet, right? And when we look at... at who we are, like we're, we're like a reasoning animal in a sense, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sum politicon or something like that, uh, the, the philosophers say. So can we inf be informed still by nature? I, I mean, it seems to me like the diversity, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a far stretch, a little bit from, from biology maybe itself, and maybe even take out biology because I think that's, that's kind of like too scientific, right? Um, just mm -hmm. informed by nature, right? We're in a planet, we're f floating in the universe, we look at the stars, we look at rivers, we look at mountains, we look at the sun rising up, setting down, we look at ourselves, we look at the animal kingdom, and we try to make sense of who we are, of why we're here, and of our of our, maybe even our sexuality, our minds, like what is the mind, what is the heart, like all these questions, right? So do you think we're, we're still informed by nature when it comes to gender um, identity? Mm -hmm. Well, it would definitely depend on who you, who you are talking to, the degree to which that feels um, kind of prescriptive around gender identity. I would say there are on a continuum, people who would say, you know, if you look at your body and you're born male or you're born female, that's your gender identity. That ought to be synonymous. And so um, for those individuals, they would have a very high value of, of that bodily nature, right? That that is something to be revered. There's a, there's a reason for that. And alignment between biological sex and gender would be the expectation, There are, there are other people, though, who, who would say, well, wait a second, we've got these um, people who experience something outside of what is perhaps normative or, or natural, um, people with different experiences of distress of, and about a conflict there. And so in those cases, you know, perhaps, yes, there's value to this human nature, but how do we help people live in the world Um, in a healthy way in the midst of there being a conflict there? And is there room and space for those individuals um, in, in, in a natural uh, understanding of humans? And then I think the probably the most um, pure diversity lens people today would probably take issue with an idea that there's natural law. And so I, I wonder mm. if that's what you're even talking about there with nature. I think of so. Like, natural yeah, law. There's, I like that. Okay, like our our bodies um, communicate something about reality, right? And that mm. kind of inscribed in our very nature um, are these realities of perhaps male-female sexual difference. There is a very clear shift socioculturally today against that. And that really comes from gender theorists primarily. Um, it's, it's out of postmodern thought, feminist thought to say that, you know, our bodies ought not be prescriptive of our gender identity. They ought not be prescriptive of our fertility. Um, so these kind of moves that we've seen socioculturally around how much we value the body. <laughs> mm. um, and, and I think that actually factors in a great deal to the at least the philosophical debate about do we have a human nature? Is there anything that can be said about that? And what value do we have around the body? And can we change the body almost as, as we will to make it more comfortable to us, to make it in alignment with our gender identity? Um, is it merely a, a kind of performative element or is there something about it that's essentially communicating who we are? Wow. Okay. So uh, two words, faith 
and reality that you've been talking about. So when, so let's let's think of the people that are experienced, whichever of the three lenses. But I, I well, this is where I want to go. Like I feel like you can't get to f to faith. Uh, it's just it strikes me as so interesting that when it comes to sexuality. Like, we got to think about God. Like, we got to think about morality. We got to think about whether it's sin or it's not sin. We got to think about whether um, I'm going to be shamed because of my, my decisions or because I was born like this. Uh, but it's all because of the idea that is there a God, almost like, is there a God that's judging me? Is there a God that, um, that made me this way? And if he did, why? Or she, right? I mean, <laughs> for... For all um, purposes, maybe some people refer to God as she. And so with that in mind, it just strikes me as like, why are people pursuing faith? Like it, 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 when it comes to gender identity, like why have you experienced? Like, why do people even say, I, I want to know? And what does that look like? Is, does that look like like redeeming? Does that look like you know, connecting to the universe? What is faith? What does faith look like or what can it look like? for people who are experiencing, you know, whichever of the three lenses, the diversity lens, the integrity lens, or the disability lens? Mm -hmm. Well, it definitely depends on the person, right? I mean, I, I think there are people who are raised Christian who have encountered Christ in a powerful way, believe that he's the savior, the savior of the world, have committed their lives to him, want to serve him in their lives, and find themselves wrestling with gender identity. And so I, I think their faith would look uh, similar to uh, many other Christians in certain ways as far as, you know, perhaps going to church on Sunday, praying to God, reading scripture, trying to know him more, and to know how he sees them. And I think that's where there can be conflicts, even on a spiritual level for people, is um you know, certainly I, I think we can look at scripture passages, the Ten Commandments, and they say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. And, um, you know, when people look at scripture and say, so God, where do you speak to my experience of gender dysphoria? And what does that mean? That it, it's hard to know, perhaps, just if you were to open the Bible like a manual and know, okay, with your specific experience, here's how you discern your path in life. And so that's a place of, I think, tension and value for people that they can bring their questions to God um, and, and hopefully feel like he cares about them and their experience. I think some people who leave behind Christian faith, who are raised in those communities, do so because they do come to a place of believing that God doesn't care about them or God doesn't account for them um, or God punished them by by creating them a certain way. And so there can be a lot of anger at God that can come out, I, I think, all across the, the board for people of any time we have suffering in life. Um, you know, how does a good God allow for that? And so those are some of the questions of theodicy that I see. And then certainly there are people who don't have a faith in a Christian God and, and may— um, want to encounter the divine through spirituality more broadly, I suppose. But um, I think some of the assumptions that can be made about transgender people or people with gender dysphoria um, is that they have rejected Christian faith. And I think that's sad to me because um, it, it erases a group of people in our churches who are there or perhaps would like to be there, but believe I couldn't step foot in a church because if I did, people would assume that I don't love God. And if I did, I would look and act like them. And so um, I, I think there's space to recognize, yeah, that as we set, sit across from somebody and hear their story, um, especially people of faith, um, it, wouldn't it be interesting to hear them share for themselves? Like, mm -hmm. here's how uh, I come to know Christ and here's, um, you know, how I think about and experience my relationship with him. Um, because sometimes if we, if we see it solely as like, let me come in and teach you about Christ, it's, you know, some of the people I've met with, with gender dysphoria have very mature faiths and I wouldn't want to feel as if I'm giving them what they don't already have. In some cases, I have a lot to learn and receive from them as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you think, do you think truth is complete? Like, do you think as humans, we can access 
like the fullness of truth because you were mentioning that or i don't know if you were mentioning but i guess you kind of were mentioning you, you mentioned the word reality so and so i, I want to pair these two words together is truth the base for reality can we have a reality can reality is reality reality does reality exist and is it informed by truth and and then we'll move on to to maybe the elements of truth that might be lies or no the, the half truths or whatever but let's start right there do you feel like there is a the truth is the the base for reality mm -hmm. yeah so you know as a christian i i do um you know i, I think that's something that christianity offers distinctly right is is christ is the way and the truth and the life and um no one can come to the Father except through Him. I mean, I, I believe that as a Christian. And so um, I think truth does coincide with reality. I think the hard part is, is when we live on this side of eternity, is a lot of reality does not reflect the fullness of the truth. And um, that's certainly true in my own life and then in the lives of, of people I work with clinically where, you know, th things exist in reality that are not what we're made for. And I, I do um, see that as a consequence of the fall. So so it's kind of how do we live in the not yet, I suppose, where we're not in heaven and the fullness of truth is not reflected in, in our reality, but we live in a natural world that is, is touched by sin and brokenness and um, all kinds of things that make it hard to come to know, I think, the fullness of the truth. Okay, so if there... So I guess another way to say it is if there is a truth, if there is truth, I mean, even if truth is not complete, let's just say, assume, you know, that truth is, is not complete. But the fact that there is truth uh, me, would mean that there are, there are also lies, right? That there's also a, a false sense of things, right? Maybe even a false sense of reality. So with that in mind, is there a... And especially when I think of scripture, you know, and maybe, I, yeah, maybe this is a little bit of the integrity versus disability lens where when we wrestle with scripture, especially, particularly, um, there's, there's, um, I don't know how to say it, right? Like, uh, there's books in the Bible, right? That kind of like talk about the morality of sexuality, things like that. Not even just in Genesis, I mean, Romans and Uh, uh, Corinthians and other other books, right? So, are those there to inform us? Are those like if, if the Bible is the truth, right? Is that there to inform us about maybe lies within us, or do you think like how do we approach wrestling with with those concepts of truth that come from Scripture? That maybe for people it's like this is the truth. This is like the complete fullness of truth, right? But um, how do we wrestle with those? Uh, with the engaging scriptures as truth and maybe engaging ourselves as do we know the truth? Are we living lies about ourselves, even in our identities? Like, is, is, is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that is the million dollar question, perhaps the Christian <laughs> has okay. been ding, for ding, 2,000 ding, ding. years, right? <laughs> is like, how do we how do we approach scripture, which is the word of God and, and glean a what he's actually communicating to us today about our personhood and our identity in real time. And I, I think you're right. It's not just Genesis that speaks to sexual ethics. Um, and, and perhaps it's infused in scripture in in many different ways, explicitly and implicitly. Um, and I, I think you're, you're getting at the largest challenge, I think, for the, the Christian person is how, how do I come to know the truth of, um, God and, and how he sees me in his word and in his word revealed in scripture, perhaps paramount, uh, and then um, the expressions that I see in the world. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that is simultaneously communal and personal, right? That mm -hmm. that happens both in the context of our faith communities where we get shepherded. Um, it's less the work I do clinically, which is more helping people go to their faith community, go to their pastors, go to personal prayer, um, and, and wrestle with God. Um, and certainly I do that in my own life and, and as a mentor or a, um, leader in my own church, but I, 
I think a, a big piece of that is both personal and communal. And so uh, if it was as simple as saying, here's how you do that, I, I think, you know, none of this would be as complicated as it um, as it is. But God certainly is not surprised by where we are. Mm. And I do believe he's ready to help each of us actually uh, discern uh, the truth and, and, and the lies that we can believe about ourselves. Okay, so communal and personal, I love those that we, we kind of walk in both at the same time. So from your vantage point, from what you're experiencing, from the voices you've been listening to, from the people you've been counseling, um, mm -hmm. even the, your own emotions about maybe, maybe the anger towards whatever you've witnessed, people facing the hurt, um, what would you have to say to the broader faith community when it comes to people experiencing uh, gender anything, you know, like gender identity, dysphoria, uh, ex experimenting with different genders? I mean, Demi Lovato, right? Like yesterday said, I'm, I'm no longer uh, they, them. Now I'm she, her again because I'm, I feel a little more feminine again. So <laughs> things like that where people, I mean, Society, culture, is, it's, it's even experiencing as we go, right? One day it's one thing and the d next day it shifts even for people um, outside in our culture, right? So what do you want to say? What do you wish to say? How do you think the faith community could do better uh, talking about this? Yeah. You know, I think the church is at its best and we as individual Christians are at our best when we don't engage solely on the socio-political front, but that we engage person to person, human to human. Um, and I, I think it's so easy in such tense, important conversations to get so activated, whether it's fear, <laughs> having a fear response. How do these shifts impact my family, my child, my church, my school? Um, an anger response when we hear things that we disagree with or we think are a threat to us or unjust or inaccurate or untrue. Um, we can get stirred up in anger. Um, uh, we, we can get despairing and kind of feel defeated, like we have nothing to say in this space. And I think all of that leads us actually not to be equipped to evangelize well. And so my hope for our churches is that we can bring down the intensity of some of those emotions, not that they're irrelevant or they're unimportant. I mean, talk about them, share them in safe places. And when I'm sitting across from a person, especially a person who's not a Christian, who sees all this differently from me, I would love for them to walk away from an encounter with me and feel as if they've never been treated with the dignity like they were when they sat across from me. Um, you know, it's that old adage, they'll know we're Christians by our love. And uh, I think that sometimes we feel as if I can't sit across from you and talk to you and be respectful of you because I'm so caught up in maybe how we see things differently um, or what my hope is for you in your life. And I know in my own personal walk with Christ, the, the people who have blessed me in my faith communities have been willing to accompany me. <laughs> in my life where it actually is. And they don't tend to stand five steps ahead and say, well, if you walk this, then I'll stay with you. And if you go right, good luck. <laughs> um, I, I think that there's a commitment to walk with people that is lacking a lot of times when we're in such complex realities as those people are wrestling with today. And so as the culture changes and shifts and people evolve, you know, let's take a long-term view. Let's commit to walk the journey out with fellow believers and people who are not people of faith. And let's remember that literally every single person that we sit across from is made in God's image and likeness. And we're the ones that believe that. So if we don't treat them that way, um, we're in some trouble and <laughs> in, in convincing people that we serve a God who created them out of love. All right. I love that. Thank you, Julia. So this is what we're going to do right now. We're going to go to the gods of Emojitron to have an emoji reaction to our talk today. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Emoji Tombola. Reveal the emoji. And it's the inspired emoji reaction. I love that. Inspired emoji. So this is what we're going to do, Julia. From your vantage point, we're going to walk 
through the five emojis and you're gonna tell us your ideas to summarize the episode. Now I'm gonna do something different on this one for blasphemous. So normally I say, can you tell me what is the most blasphemous idea you can think of when it comes to you know, your topic? So in this case, gender identities and faith. But on this specific episode, I want to ask this question. Where do you see most harm done when it comes to gender and faith? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the most harm that's done is communicating to people that... Um, by virtue of their wrestling with gender, uh, they can't have a relationship with God, uh, that they have to have all of that figured out before they can approach Him in prayer. Um, and, and that's heartbreaking to me. And that's where I think people walk away from faith um, because they feel like they're excluded from it on principle. Wow. Skeptical? Um, where do you see skepticism played out or wh what are you skeptical of still when it comes to gender identity and faith? Yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical as to whether or not uh, we as Christians will really be willing to engage critically in the culture or whether we will silo ourselves. I think um, all throughout Christian history, we've seen ourselves try to figure out that balance of how do I engage culture without being swallowed up by it. And I'm curious as to how that will play out here. Will we silo or will we continue to engage and um, encounter people who are different in the spirit of uh, evangelization? Wow, that was so good. Inspire, uh, what gives you hope in this conversation? Yeah, I, I feel enormous hope, especially when I meet with people who they themselves experience gender dysphoria, who are actively seeking God's will and plan for their lives and are willing to follow Him uh, no matter where this life leads. Oof, so good. Holy is one to the last. So holy, um, where do you see holiness played out or what is a holy idea when it comes to gender identities and pursuing faith? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think something that I've wrestled with a good bit and some people have found helpful is this idea that God himself took on a human body <laughs> and mm -hmm. elevated our human nature and knew uh, knew what it was like to not be at home on earth. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be said about the way in which in all of our experiences of being embodied and perhaps those of us who feel least at home in our bodies, that we can know that the God of all the universe, while he didn't have gender dysphoria, <laughs> he, he knew, knew the pain of being embodied. And I, I think there's mm -hmm. probably some deep spiritual realities that we can encounter through our own experience of wrestling with our human existence. Oof, that was good. And just to say... I'm going to have a talk this Sunday here at church where it's going to be called How to Talk to Aliens. So I might put it here on YouTube, so check it out later on. I'll put probably the link in the description too, because uh, that's what kind of like I reflected on as you elaborated on holy. But lastly, divine. What is the highest idea, the most divine, the, the, no, the one we should all pursue maybe when it comes to gender identity? and faith yeah uh, yeah when you say that I think my my response is God has a plan uh, God's not scrambling for a plan B that he knows intimately where we are and as scared angry confused uh, as we may be um, he loves us each personally and he cares deeply um, about each of our souls and and wants us to come to know him more. So good. All right, my friends. Well, there you have it. What an amazing conversation with Julia Sadaski. This was super helpful for me. Now my, 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 <laughs> my paper is full of stuff. And it's all from these conversations. As much as I could, I tried not to incorporate 
ideas from outside, even though I think I did a little bit, especially when I talked about scripture. But other than that, here it is. Thank you, Julia or Julia, for, for being on the show. My friends, I just want to say, if this episode is helpful for you, like, subscribe, share it with a friend. It helps a lot. We got to make this the number one show on Google. So rate us, give us a positive review, whatever you're watching, whether that's YouTube, Roku TV, or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all of those good shabangs. So Julia, where do you want to point people to, to find your book, to find maybe your writings? If they need help, how can they find you? Maybe if they're in Colorado, right? Yeah, so I have a website, uh, my first and last name. It's kind of easy, www.juliasadusky.com. Uh, that's one way to keep in touch with the work I'm doing or reach out for support. Um, certainly podcasts like these are always populating the internet. So that's another way to keep in touch. And then um, the two books I've written with Mark Yarhouse are available on Amazon or Brazos Press for the first, which is called Emerging Gender Identities, Understanding the Diverse Experiences of Today's Youth. The second book, Gender Identity and Faith, uh, that's through Inner Varsity Press. Um, and that one is also available on Amazon. Love it. on the next Salvation Mission.